This is Jesse Hensley. And this is Josh Turner. Welcome to Turn Down for What. Welcome back to the second episode of our special Talking to Whisper Arrow. And last week we discussed aircraft with Whisper Arrow. Um, we'll have a little bit more of that today, but another item that was brought up is aircraft and boats and how do they work together. So I was trying to figure out your motors do not, you probably could make them, put them underwater, but the efficiency like you talked about wouldn't be there. But what could you do on the boat side of things or the watercraft with the, and utilize your, your product? Yeah, so, you know, our fans work really well with air. Uh, and if you want to delve into the physics, it has to do with, you know, the compressibility of air versus the incompressibility of, of water. But, you know, if you got to propel a boat and the thrust is thrust, whether it's in the air or, or, you know, in the water. And there are air boats where they've got big fans at the back um, used in swamps, used by, you know, special forces, Marines. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I definitely think there is a world where our fans make their way onto air boats and uh you know help for everything from you know tourist kind of trips to uh you know dod applications it'll be a little bit different than the uh gigantic fans you see on the back of those air they're boats. so noisy yeah, yeah they're big they're noisy i i personally i'm freaked out yeah, <laughs> it just looks like it's gonna chop your arm off because yeah. it's so high up i mean it's a high that's a big loud fan yeah um but i mean that's i mean that's a really interesting thing to think about is air boats um, cause I mean, everybody thinks that the propulsion has to come from the water, but you know, you could look at a scenario where you are layering these smaller fans around different parts of the boat. You distribute it. Yeah. yeah. And a, a distributed air than like we were discussing. I mean, you could potentially look at thrust vectoring. You could have different, um, aspects of where the fans are controlling to how to navigate that craft through the water and, and they're not, quieter yeah i mean then, then you're utilizing ultra quiet technology and more efficient and you're not even touching the water i mean that, yeah. that, that, there there is no disturbance to the water other than the actual physical and again it's been shown already that you can do that you know airboats are out there been around for years so it's not new technology just not you're the, just not the sophisticated technology well and and also you don't have a you know a gas engine you're not having to go to the the shore and filling up could leak it out. You don't have an engine that if there's problems or if there's uh, uh, seals that are leaking that you could possibly have uh, hydrocarbons getting into a protected area. So I could see this as being a very big beneficial uh, item to even some of these impacted waters and something that even science would be highly interested in if they could could utilize it. Zero emission. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm no biologist um, but or zoologist, but, you know, if you're trying to actually look at fish or wildlife and you're quiet when you're <laughs> going to see them, like chances are you're going to see some cool animal activity than if you're noisy. Yeah. You know, yeah. fisherman's delight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, that is one area, I guess. And I, I'd say on, a, on traditional boats, I could see that instead of a trolling motor, having something like yours, I mean, it's a small electric motor that's on a boat when you're, when you're fishing. So you might even be able to replace that with a, with uh, but that, something so that I mean the the airboat tech you know in order to really make that efficient would have to be tied to the electric battery space um, which is kind of where this whole conversation is but you I mean you can't put those fans to a, a gas engine uh, well, you can kind of, make it hybrid electric yeah. yeah you can make hybrid well like a trolling motor I mean it's a small prop you hook it up it, there's not a lot of power out of it so I could see that being on the ed edge of a boat and then you could steer the nose of the boat around or going and, and then you won't have a prop in the water that is, you know, sitting there making noise as you're, even though it's more silent, I could see that as being a possibility. Yeah, so you have like a turbo, you know, small turbo generator, turbo alternator, and then you're just converting fuel into electricity and you pass it into uh, the fans. And then maybe you have a battery there when you want to go really silent. And that's, that's pretty Stealth interesting. Mode. All right. Stealth mode. Hold on. Whisper mode. Oh. Whisper mode. Whisper mode. Whisper mode. We got to develop this. <laughs> I was speaking of whisper mode, though. I mean, another thing that I thought, you know, your application can be used um, and probably is being used um, or considered to be used, you know, on a stealth application for aircraft. Um, you know, these drones that are being no used comment. for <laughs> these these drones that are being used for reconnaissance. I mean, like, obviously, 
you know, the, the goal is silence and the goal is um, to have no knowledge of your presence. And, you know, it's very difficult to do things. And they have ways to mask, you know, with all the high tech uh, mask aircraft. But if you get ultra silent technology and you're able to put it inside of those aircrafts and you can fly these Reaper drone type styles or these small aircraft um, into um, uncharted territory. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I mean, the defense use case is, is pretty big. So I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, and then you can kind of use your imagination to, to think through what, what could else, you know, else could be used. But, um, you know, we have this demonstration, 55 pound, uh, it's a group two drone uh, that we developed in order to show, you know, our investors in the DOD community how quiet we could be in the air. And, you know, special operations or some of these ISR fo forces, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance forces, when they want to get imagery or video using a, a drone off the shelf today that's 55 pounds, they use something like a scan eagle. Um, but the scan eagle, it's noisy. You know, it's got um, an open propeller off the back. It's not electric or even hybrid electric. It has to fly at altitudes of like 3,000 to 5,000 feet just so it's not hurt on the ground. And when you have to fly that high, you have to install a really expensive camera, you know, gimbal camera sensor system in order to look and zoom all the way down and get the kind of information that you want. And so what's cool is that when you're quieter, you now can fly closer to the ground. Our, our demonstrator drone, you know, it's not – Again, we, we didn't necessarily design this with an operator, a specific operator in mind, but we knew we just wanted to be the quietest thing that, that, that flew in the group two class. We can fly inaudible, undetected, silent, 200 feet. <laughs> so well, that's a little bit of a difference than 5,000 feet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that 15 to 25 X difference and could be more depending on the other things you compare it to that, that huge difference in noise matters a whole lot because now you've got more mission reliability, you know, more times you can actually operate. You know, one other big thing is clouds often come around a thousand feet. You can fly under the clouds. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, you know, if the clouds are there and you can only fly at 3000 to 5,000 feet, sorry. No reconnaissance. Yeah. There's no pack your things up. Opens up a whole new world when it comes to uh, that, that application. I mean, silence has its, has its values, not only in the, Oh, and the there's residential a, case, but I mean, there's a cost component too. Like, you know, when you fly closer to the ground, you don't need that really expensive, expensive gimbaled camera system. You get cameras like on your iPhone and you stitch the pixels together uh, and you have the same quality, you know, resolution image, but the cost per tick pixels, you know, of, of that target, of that, you know, thing you want to go see. Drop significantly. Significantly. Yeah. Significantly. Yeah. And so and the risk of losing it isn't as important either because, you yeah. know, it's a lot less value that you're losing at that point. So yeah, it's it attributable. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's one thing that's open to mice for sure. Um, and, you know, our, our tech scale. So, it, you know, it doesn't mean that you have to be that small to be quiet. You know, our quiet comes in various sizes. And it's still significantly quieter than, you know, a helicopter or a PC-12 or, or something in a comparable weight class. So those noise advantages, you know, eventually turn into operational advantages, turn into cost advantages, yeah. turn into, you know, success. Yeah, because I mean, like, like we were success. discussing, I mean, you can have the residential application of a drone to deliver a pizza to your front door. But I mean, there can be national implications as far as the safety and security of, you know, certain operations that, you know, you can utilize with that silence. And it's not only uh, saving the noise pollution of your neighborhood, it's saving the noise pollution of a battlefield. Yeah, if I have a pizza getting delivered to my neighbor and I hear it I'm in my house, pizza. there's <laughs> going to be something happening. So um, definitely. But, but uh, now we know that you can bring the pizza in at 200 feet and not hear it. So. Mm, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Great delivery. So go in, winch it down, be really, really silent. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a responsibility that comes with all this, and we we take a, a good hard look at it at it um, for our customers, whether they're DoD or not, um, and we want to make sure that we're we're building technology that really matters, and again, build build a future that is uh, as considerate as it is compelling. So, what is, in your opinion, and your team's 
obviously when they look at this and some of the companies you've been with, they look long distance. They're looking 10 years or maybe even 15 years down the road. When you look at the industry as a whole for EVs, what do you think it's going to look like, say, in five years when it comes to today's market? That's a really good question. Thank you. I think in <laughs> <laughs> I think in five years, you know, we'll see these electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft really start to uh, take off. Um, you know, these companies have been investing a lot of money in certification, and you know, there are things like COVID that sort of push timetables out. But you know, a lot of good work has gone into it. It's, they have very sensible plans. They're working directly with the FAA, and so they're going to have their first vehicles out there doing sort of limited flights in a few cities. Um, I think what you'll also see is, uh, you know, more and more the regional segment. Uh, I think the regional segment has been, you know, neglected. Part of that is just because we spent a lot of time at Elevate focusing on, on the air taxi portion. Um, but I think now people are wisening up and they're seeing that there's so many there's so many players already in this urban EV tall space that uh, it doesn't make sense to compete there anymore. You should actually start looking at the regional space where there isn't, I think, yet a, a solid manufacturer developing a solution for that. Uh, and so fingers crossed we're working with someone uh, on the airframer side making that that vision concept or something like it uh, very real because it'll it'll be an enabler. Uh, for those regional um, those regional markets. And then outside of that, certainly drones are going to be uh, bigger. These beyond visual line of sight regular flights, whether it's drone delivery or, or, or other applications, I mean, I think the FAA still has a lot of work to figure that out uh, and integrate them into the national airspace. Um, so I would expect, you know, within the next five years, additional experiments to continue validating that. Um, wing zipline drone up a number of these players are going to continue pushing uh, because they they have strong conviction that these are are real markets uh, they have paying customers even today uh, and the technology is continuing to mature now if everything went well as you hope it would what con what conceptual time frame could you possibly see Euro's aircraft come to market if everything went well today and everything the way you're going two years three years i think in a perfect world if we had an airframe partner because we're a propulsion company if we had an airframe partner to team up with um and we could move forward on this jet like literally today um we it's sensible that we could have like a prototype demonstrator flying in less than five years just okay. that first prototype maybe it's not conforming uh, and the goal would be that by the end of this decade, we would have, you know, the first ones out flying, um, you know, working with a regional operator, scaling up operations. And when you look at these regional operators, a lot of them are just focused on these uh, subsidized routes by the government. And, you know, if done properly with the right enabling technologies, we think it's possible to make every single airport across the U.S. that's neglected, that's underutilized, productive again, which means that you're now connecting rural, suburban, and urban communities. You're not just kind of concentrating the economic development and growth within states in these metropolitan areas. Oh, and that's such a great use for AI too. Uh, again, having to go to that is the fact that you could then basically map out what is the best use for all these airports and get the shipments, get the transport, and could take some of the congestion from the large areas and put it on these outside without having that big of an impact as long as the infrastructure is there, hint, hint. So, um, <laughs> I mean, it, like if we're just, if we're continuing to extrapolate and, and talk in hypotheticals, I mean, in a world where you have regional air mobility and it, it's prevalent, I think you're going to see a strong concentration of economic activity focused at these regional airports, right? You, you can look at a large international airport today as kind of like, leading indicators of things that might happen at these regional airports, right? When you check in and you go, you know, to, to Nashville International or Tyson McGee, you, know, you don't just go to the terminal, sit and wait for the airplane. Like they've got shops, they've got food stands, uh, they've got vendors, they've got a bunch of services around the airport that, you know, drive 
economic activity. I think the same thing is true at these regional airports. So as soon as you know, Crossville has an, a hangar with electric chargers and uh, a fleet of regional electric aircraft or hybrid electric aircraft that can service that area, you're gonna see you know, car chargers, charging companies there. You're gonna see uh, food vendors for when people fly in or when you know someone's coming to pick their their relative or friends up and they're they're waiting and you know they want a coffee or they want a snack you're going to see people that are are willing to sell goods you know maybe they want to sell a bag maybe if i'm in uh, an airplane company and i want to make sure that you're putting the right size bag in my regional airplane that uh, i'm selling you that size bag um you know there's there's just so much economic activity that's going to reconcentrate itself near and around these 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 hubs of travel and it'll that's always cheaper. been the case when and you it'll be cheaper airport. too yeah i mean you, you go to train stations they did this at train stations uh, they still do this at train stations um as long as there are people coming together and you're you're moving them I, i'm convinced like and it allows will... it allows what drives people to significant urban areas to then spread out because of the convenience of travel like you know you can live in johnson city but technically, if you have the right things in place, you could be operating out of Nashville because there is this easiness and ease and cost effectiveness to that that transfer. Yeah. Where like we looked at going to DC, right? We were we went to DC for some um, business meetings last week, and it cost two thousand dollars to fly, and because there's no direct flight for three people, um, but because there's no direct flight, we were going to spend six hours in the airport system to get there. If I yep. hop in my electric truck and I drive there, it costs us there and back probably a hundred dollars in electric costs. Until he gets a fee for driving in the wrong lane, uh, but we won't get into that. We'll fix that next time. Too. <laughs> Easy now, pass. now, a right. little, little uh, uh, real quick on that too. We did speak with our company that we're going to be working with on our solar panels, and that'll be another episode coming up. And I believe we have a solar expert too lined up here in the next few weeks that will be coming in and kind of going over that industry. So we have a few surprises there and a couple announcements, maybe if we can get it done in time for that. But anyway, sorry. Yeah. So I mean, the the <laughs> overall experience for that, you know, three businessmen want to go from Johnson City a rural airport, there is no direct flight from here to DC. But if there was that use case of the regional mobility, then that might allow for something more efficient. Whereas I'd have to fly from here, south to Atlanta, Atlanta up to DC, and it's six hours in an airport, not including checking in, getting your bags. I can drive straight there in six. And well, I mean, it doesn't and make It's the sense. industry too with you all, because yeah. like you said, the industry's changed for big cities, you know, in the data industry, you're, you can work from home now, get a bet, probably get more done there. So why do you have to live in a big, expensive city? Exactly. Yeah. So, so here's how I frame it, right? Like your everyday life, you can kind of draw a radius on a map of what your everyday life, you know, looks like where, where your grocery store is, where your, your kid's school is, uh, where your office is. That radius of your everyday life, though, it's it's really defined by your mobility options, right? And we all had horses and wagons. Right? It was it was, it was a, a much tighter circle. radius, yeah. 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 <laughs> and now that we've got our our cars and you know better electric cars, it's a bigger radius. When you have a, a really prevalent regional mobility solution, you've got big radii. And now, instead of having to live in a tiny, cramped, expensive apartment downtown Nashville or downtown New York or wherever, you name your metropolitan city of choice, if you have this huge radius of your everyday life because it's enabled by these, these longer range, affordable, sustainable, and even faster um, regional air mobility solutions, um, People are not going to just concentrate them themselves in these cities. They're going to they're going to move out. Yeah, um, and that's a good thing for everyone. Yeah, right. It, yep. it spreads out the population where you can have rural America participating in the same conversations that are they're not America. lost. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's more efficient that way too. You don't have to have the drain on the power grid. You don't have to do things it spreads that out. that is less. Per kWh, I, I guess is is one way of saying it. In big cities, it costs more to have that same thing there once you go vertical, whereas you don't have to have that infrastructure, which does save 
you know, more uh, environmental items when you're out into the country. So, you know, again, it just gives people options and that's the big part of it. You can do take your, your craft and utilize the smaller airports with that. And it costs less than for the big airports, then people are probably going to do that. You have safer options when it comes to the, the number of items that spin on that plane. It's cheaper overall. You know, there's a lot of things you could point at, and none of it is something you can't point at and say, well, it's better. It's not as good as this one because of X. I mean, there, there's so many things there that outdo any negatives that I think only time and technology very soon will take care of most of the negatives that are on that as well. Kind of like our trucks. You know, there's there's a few things I would like to have different, but once you do, there I can't find anything that I would rather have on the trucks that I've purchased before that one. So it's it's just that transaction or that transition between the two of them. And, it, you know, you were talking about business trips, but, you know, it doesn't have to just be business trips. Like if you have family and friends across the state, you know, instead of a, a once a year trip, you, you can see them every day. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, leisure, right? Yeah. You can go visit a tourist site and be back in the same day. Yeah, you want to go to Dollywood every day, you can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Land my aircraft in Dolly's parking lot there and be like, hey, Queen, how you doing? So, Queen of Tennessee. So, we also have a couple, qu I have another question. So, obviously, you're located in Middle Tennessee, if anybody's wanting to know. You have a huge expansion that's been announced over the last few weeks. Uh, or a month or so. So you have people that you're looking for. Can you kind of go into the details of, you know, luckily why you chose Middle Tennessee? Absolutely. And then what you're looking for, because there's a lot of people that want to have those jobs in technology slash aeronautics, because that's something great for everybody. It's two technologies. It's not going to any anytime soon. And then what you may be looking for to hire in the next few months. Sure. Well, I mean, this is going to come off sales pitchy, so I'm just going to hit it on the head. I mean, <laughs> we're, we're hiring. We're looking to double the team. Uh, we're looking for test engineers, manufacturing folks, technicians um, in lots of different roles. And, um, you know, we have a manufacturing and test center in Crossville, Tennessee. We have an en engineering and design center out in Nashville. That's an 8,000 square foot space. Um, and, and really, just if you look at Tennessee, there is just so much activity in you know, electric vehicles, right? Whether it's Ford, GM, Nissan investing in factories across batteries and, and motors. Um, and, you know, you just find that the state of Tennessee itself is, is even a business friendly state, whether that's taxes, but also even some of the, the things that the state is doing to uplift entrepreneurs and startups. Um, you know, Tennessee is doing some things where instead of trying to concentrate startup activity in a single area, they're actually trying to create a statewide network, right? They're trying to make sure that entrepreneurs in Memphis and Nashville and Chattanooga and Knoxville and Johnson City are all, you know, unified and can tap into the resources that the state is providing. Um, and so for all those reasons, it, it made for a really nice, um, initially a proving ground for, for Whisper and now um, a, a home and uh, a manufacturing, you know, uh, center for us. We started off in, in this very cool, you know, my co-founder bought uh, an old resort in the middle of Tennessee in Crossville. It's a 20 acre resort. You can look it up online. Um, it's on a lake. Uh, there's uh, a mini beach with beach volleyball courts, basketball <laughs> courts, tennis courts. There's a corporate headquarters for you. It, it's pretty hey, awesome. Corporate headquarters or evil layer. There's a fine, <laughs> <laughs> there's a fine tooth. I like, there. To say, I like to say secret lab. There we Secret go. Lab. That, that lab. Work, that, that's good of both worlds. It can yeah, be either yeah. or. Yeah. <laughs> um, we uh, we built up the secret lab, and it was really cool because you know uh, our employees could move in, and literally we were living, working, and playing in this future we wanted to develop. I mean, the local airport, Cross Crossville Memorial Airport, is five minutes away. Oh wow! So right every there. day we're, we're working on these quiet fans, and then you hear a Pilatus or a Cessna Skyhawk, or even sometimes the Blackhawks when they fly in. They're just, they're so noisy. And it's this constant reminder like, okay, yeah. this What is, we're doing makes a difference. Yeah. It, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And if I don't do it faster, like I'm gonna keep hearing this thing in the, you know, the other part of the, <laughs> the building. Um, and so we were working there for like two and a half years, uh, really awesome space. 
we would literally build in the mornings and then at night we would test it, it, we'd convert the tennis court into a testing ground <laughs> and then uh it, you know before it was done you pack everything up and uh you know start all over again so that was really fun um we've grown so much though that uh, that's now too small and so now there's a 40,000 square foot space we're moving into in crossville uh it's part of a larger 123,000 square foot building that Tennessee Tech is standing up. Uh, and the cool thing there is it's kind of a collaboration with them. You know, they really want to build up this EV incubator there in Crossville. Um, and in addition to that incubator space, there's going to be a wind tunnel, a pretty large wind tunnel, 100, 160-ish by 64 feet, something like that, with an 8-foot by 9-foot test section, blowing low turbulence air at 130 miles per hour as well as a supercomputer that's on site. And essentially these resources plus Tennessee Tech plus Whisper uh, hopefully creates this melting pot for future entrepreneurs in, in middle Tennessee that want to innovate you know, technologies in this EV space. So that's, that's Crossville. That's where we're having our, our manufacturing and, and tests sort of centralized. So many cool resources there. And then Nashville's uh, again, an area where we're, we're continuing to capture more talent um, keeps us close to, you know, the state um, and also some of the, the entrepreneurial centers there, too. And Tennessee, as we were discussing earlier, I mean, Tennessee is the center pretty much of the nation. And so much comes through this region that it's a good launching yeah. pad for the whole, I mean, the whole eastern region. I mean, we kind of just take up a, a long bit of the United States. And so you can 60 percent of that traffic, yeah. you know, of, of cargo traffic passing through the 40. And so when you have so, so much of that passing through, you know, people are going to stop uh, and uh, and notice. And, and especially when you have big companies starting to coalesce here and then even the smaller companies, too, rising up. Um, and you still have the amenities of being in, you know, a very green area to yeah. the mountains and the and the TVA lake system. Yeah. So uh, a lot of clean energy in Tennessee as well. So there's a lot of benefits on all sides i kind of hate that people are now finding it out because you know it's been our little gym for now for up to I now can't but at the same time if you build it in a way that helps the future then tennessee's future is going to be very bright and yeah. i think companies like yours and these others that you mentioned is a prime example of our leadership in tennessee you know we were an event uh, where governor lee was at and he was you know, talking here just a few days ago about his initiatives to help the rural communities in the roadways and the education programs. So there is a real big push to help the the rural areas of Tennessee. And I think, you know, companies like yours is a great example of where that can go. So, yeah, I think there's just going to be so many opportunities and, you know, it shows, it shows uh, as we continue to push and we build out more of these like propulsion systems um, that will naturally lend itself to needing to integrate them on aircraft and fly them. And so luckily, even the hangar at, at the airport, um, there's a lot of development going on at Crossville Airport where we're, we're going to stand up a future flight test center there. And hopefully that can serve as a model for other places or across the state where we can electrify those airports, build new hangars, uh, and then, you know, really be that proving ground for regional air mobility in the United States. I mean, I, I think there's, there's other states that want this, but um, with the right, it, it always starts with people. I mean, the right people with the right perspectives and the right business environment too because yeah. if you're taxing everything to where it, you're getting every single penny of it it's kind of hard to innovate and spend that money on future technologies that may or may not make any money because a lot a lot of this is future i mean we're, we're planning yeah. now what the future is going to look like in 20 years and it's a matter of strategy um because like you're saying we're probably not going to see significant release of these products for 10 years with certifications and getting crawl walk run. yeah and right now we are in the crawl stage um, and, you know, we'll get to the walking stage in 10 years, but ideally what we're doing today and what your company's doing today, 20 years from now will lead to a, what horse and buggy did to cars will be what, you know, we're going from cars, what's going to happen with this new uh, ideology of transportation. And, you know, obviously that's something that we've spent some time talking about, you know, this future world of what could be 
but that that's what we're what we're doing today is leading to that in 20 years absolutely um, yeah. and my kids will grow up and in 20 years they could be uh, visiting me in the nursing home uh Via. Let's push for sooner. Let's yeah. push for sooner. <laughs> yeah, we had this, it, could, it could be ten. We had this phrase at Elevate. It was always, uh, you know, the future is closer than you think. Well, and when best... you have kids, that's actually <laughs> the best <laughs> thing because you don't know how quick it gets there until you have kids. But yeah, just, so tomorrow, you know, when you look up and realize, oh, that's an EV aircraft. All oh, that has my engines in it or my motors in it. You know, that could easily be something that happens very, very quick. So yeah, and I mean, I, I think. They're flying today. Yeah. yeah. There, uh, you know, there, there are regional fixed wings that are electric or hybrid electric flying today. It's who is going to build the one that actually builds something that consumers want. Who is going to be the Tesla? Today, it's the other ones. Right. Who's going to make that Tesla? It's kind of like when the, when, the, when the Honda Jet came out, it was like, wow, that is so innovative. And it, it, basically the same, same that was out there, but it was a different package that was very attractive. And there was a lot of like really cool aerodynamics that they yeah. they uh, integrated into that. But it's all about can you develop something that's faster and more affordable and community friendly and reliable? If you can win on all those dimensions, then uh, you know that to me is a real that a real regional air mobility. Now, what do you and think? then charge it with us? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you, what what is your thoughts on uh, what's the brand that we talked about a couple of weeks ago with the flying car that got certified oh wow i have no clue but wow yeah oh are you, oh man that yeah a lot of vaporware out there yeah yeah a lot of vaporware out there um the the idea of like a flying drivable car uh, i think they've been talking about that for years and, i know yeah. well I, they're just fundamentally different things don't even stop trying to merge the two yeah yeah i can crash a car just as easy as i can an <laughs> aircraft i don't want to do them both at the same time so yeah well, thank you very much. This has been absolutely fantastic to have you in talking about this. Um, hopefully we can uh, have you back sometime. Uh, we'll definitely come by on one of our trips to Nashville and see the facility. In Crossville. In Crossville, Tennessee. Um, if, there's a Bucky's nearby, so you're good if you need to stop by Bucky's. <laughs> we can't yet. So uh, but hopefully that'll be coming soon. But uh, anyway, thank you very much for joining us again. This has been our second episode of our special uh, reports on Whisper Arrow. Thank you for listening. Turn